Hi everyone, Patrick Donahoe here, and welcome to this week's episode of the Well Standard Podcast. Uh, we're on episode two of uh, this this season called um, Liberty, and I'm actually really excited about the, about this season because it's a it's a topic that I feel very strongly about, and I know that discussion around it and really extending you know really all the ways in which you can understand this vital value uh, this core principle of, uh, of our country is going to be paramount to, to your success so this week's uh, episode is going to be pretty cool because I have this guy named James Whitaker who is uh, an entrepreneur uh, from Australia and he took it upon himself to uh, help create a multi-million dollar film around uh, a book that we actually discussed in season one, uh, which is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And this is, uh, this, there's a book as well. So the book, the book is called uh, The Legacy, Grow Rich, The Legacy, but it revolves around a lot of those stories associated with uh, Think and Grow Rich and how it's changed people's uh, perspective on life. And I know it uh, has changed a lot of yours uh, as well as it has mine. So this week's episode, I'm going to talk to James. It's a video interview, so definitely go check that out on YouTube if you're listening to the, the, the audio here. And we also are going to give away uh, some copies of his book, and you can see it uh, right here. It's actually, um, I, I watched the documentary or the film, and it's a really, really good film. Haven't dove into the book yet. Uh, but we're going to give away copies of the book for those of you who uh, go into iTunes, give us a good review, and take a snapshot. If you'll send that uh, to podcast at paradigmlife.net, then you can uh, we'll, we'll ship that out to you, uh, and we'd be more than glad to. Okay, so you guys are going to enjoy this episode, and uh, next week is actually going to be really amazing too, so stay tuned for that one. Welcome to the 2018 seasons of the Wealth Standard Podcast, celebrating life, liberty, and property. You are listening to Liberty Season 2. Okay, James, it is wonderful uh, to have you. You're coming from uh, beautiful Southern uh, California, but welcome, uh, welcome to the show. I'm lo really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, Patrick. Great to be here. So, so James, you, know, you, you tackled something that uh, I think was, was, neat, was uh, needed in a sense, which was you know, taking what I consider one of the more influential books uh, for, for people and, and putting kind of a, a modern type of uh, you know, resurrection of it, right? Where you're, you took it and you create a film, you wrote a book, why don't you walk us through the process and the events that took place that led to the point where you're like, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Well, uh, Thinking Grow Rich to take you right back was obviously released in 1937 and was really based on these interviews that Hill had had with people like Andrew Carnegie and Thomas Edison and Henry Ford. And it's just a, a fact that people today don't really seem to identify as much with those people who were really the titans of industry back in the day. So the whole film and the book project now uh, came about by thinking about the best ways that we could use the power and the principles of the best-selling self-help book of all time to reach an entirely new generation and an entirely new audience. Because... The original book is completely timeless, but there's an opportunity for us to add more value and introduce it to a new audience and really get people excited about it. So in conjunction with the Napoleon Hill Foundation, we were able to create this film and write this book, which has been very well received. And it's also something that we're, we're very honored to do and also want to make sure we, we do something that was a, a tribute to Napoleon Hill's legacy. So was there, was there, a, was there a moment that or a series of moments that you started to think about this? Was it, you know, reading the book again? Was it thinking about a certain teaching in the book or, or you made a connection? I mean, what was, what was that kind of series of events that's, that basically motivated you to take on this venture? Cause it's a venture. I mean, the, doing something like you did it, it's a wonderfully produced uh, film and I've not read the book yet, but uh, the film itself is, is fantastic. I mean, what compelled you to, to want to do that? Well, I, I had an opportunity to meet the filmmakers. So at that stage, there was director Scott Servine and there were the other people on the film side uh, being Sean Donovan, Karina Donovan and Joel Franco. 
So between those four, they were the ones who had been able to get the ball rolling on this entire project, again, in conjunction with the Napoleon Hill Foundation. It's just been great having their, having their back to get all this done. And when I met with them, I just asked them about the, what idea they had to release a book with the film. And they were just so busy with the day-to-day running of the film, they hadn't really had much of a chance to think about it. So I basically pitched them a concept because I had always been interested in the self-help field. I really grew up on on Jim Rohn and, and Napoleon Hill and those things as well. And of course, Napoleon Hill really is the godfather of the whole self-help field, regardless of what book you read nowadays. And having that opportunity to meet them, they really understood that uh, I appreciated just how big and how grandiose their vision was going to be. And they understood that I wanted to make something that really aligned with, with that purpose. So yeah, we had a, a great meeting of the minds and they asked if I could write the book and I said I would be honored to do so. And then I came on board as a co-executive producer of the film and uh, yeah, here we are. So, so as you, you know, maybe a good direction to take is to, to talk about the, impact that it made on you. I mean, you, you mentioned just briefly that, you know, you had kind of created or had this affinity toward uh, self-help, you know, Dale, Dale Carnegie, uh, Jim Rohn, uh, Napoleon Hill. I mean, there's was, there was a lot of those, you know, in the early 1900s that, uh, that, that came about. But what, what was it that made that connection with, uh, with you and impacted your life? Well, When Think and Grow Rich, Bob Proctor says that 99% of people read Think and Grow Rich and do nothing with it. And that's the, when we're talking about self-help material, anything that you read or digest in the self-help world, you can only bring to it your experiences to that point. So if you're, if you've been on this earth for 15 years, you've only got 15 years of experience to and knowledge to bring to that. Uh, to help create context and perspective. And if you're 30 reading it or 40 or 50 reading it, and that's why Bob Proctor has read this book every day for 58 years, why Sharon Lecter reads it every year, why Rob Deerdeck reads it every couple of years. So I read it when I was super young, like in my early teens, and I thought it was good, but it didn't really, it didn't really hit me to the point of me going out and taking consistent purposeful action. But I tell you what, when I, I, I just really had aligned a lot with Jim Rohn because I was listening to a lot of his audio recordings. But then when I revisited this, oh my God, it just absolutely blew me away. And now I've been reading it every day for the last two and a half years. And you know, I just, when I finish it, I just keep reading it. And, and Bob Proctor even says, you can open up any page you want on the book and you could probably spend a whole day just delving into the material and trying to, to think about what it is because it really is a timeless blueprint. It's a lot of people think it's uh, read it. I think a mistake a lot of people make is that they read it like a novel Mm -hmm. where if they're a couple chapters in and they think, oh, well, this isn't really exciting me, they might put it away. Or even if they do finish the book, they might put it away and never read it again. But it is really looking at this a a bit like a textbook. You need to reread it and come up with a plan and make it happen. And then, of course, as you stumble, revisit the book and it will, with your increased experiences, it will show you the way forward again. So all the answers are in this book. And that is what excited me, the opportunity to help change people's lives. It's what excited us with the film. We just want to change billions of people's lives around the planet. And that's everyone who's in this film as well. And in the book, we just want to, all of us, help inspire the planet to think bigger than their circumstances, develop this unwavering self-belief to make it happen and really give them a blueprint to achieve the success as they define it uh, in all areas of their lives. Yeah, I remember, you know, because the Think and Go Rich was originally, well, the, the law of success was done in, in lectures or, or lessons, right? I think there's, there's actually some video on, online that you can actually see him doing the lectures, which, which is really interesting. Again, going to your original point, which is, you know, there was, there was language, there was accent, there was, you know, things that he said that, you know, most people wouldn't understand just because it applied to, you know, society in, the, in those days. Uh, and so obviously, you know, you, you being involved in a project that kind of resurrects it and creates, you know, context in a different light based on today's society, I think is, uh, is definitely relevant, but what, you know, cause I agree with you, 99% of people read it, but don't, don't understand it. Uh, what, let's, let's dig into that a little bit. You know, I, I, you know, cause it, it impacted me drastically. I'd read it before, but then during 2009, 2010, um, you know, I had some, you know, extreme adversity with, with business, with investment. 
and you know in my personal life with my with my marriage and it, you know it it caused me to be in a different place uh mentally where you know my walls broke down and when they broke down i i was open right to to more i was more aware i was less guarded and protected vulnerable and and i and at least the connection i've made is that that environment is what allowed me to you know seek not just the the teachings but a way in which to execute or incorporate them uh, so talk, you know, th that may be just exclusive to me, but maybe talk about, you know, your experience as you've done this, you've most likely seen the stories of countless people. What, what are the maybe common themes of the environment that, that made a person, you know, read it and understand you know, everything, but an element that caused a significant, you know, change in their life? Well, when we think about people, we grow up, you look at children and I always feel like uh, the babies and children are the best teachers because they just don't have any boundaries. They're the, they're the best salespeople as well. And they just want to experience all these new sensations and they really don't, they could get out of their comfort zone, but they don't really have one. But then of course, for good reason, they get reprimanded by their parents. But then when they go into school, they start to get reprimanded by their teachers. And then as they go into the workforce, they start to get reprimanded by their bosses and worrying what their friends and their family and what everyone else is going to think. They have a fear of failure, a fear of criticism. And the result of that is you start to turn down the volume of your inner voice. You've had this, by the time you've had two decades of this uh, programming, this negative programming, it's very, very difficult to get in touch with who it is that you are and where you want to go. And then people who are aware of that, they then think to themselves, how did I get here? And, but the next step is to actually, which not a lot of people do is to think about where they want to go and what can they do to get there? So it's from that moment when they find themselves at that crossroad is to be able to think forward and being proactive about it rather than dwelling on what has happened in the past and, and, and what has, you know, what has impacted their lives because for many people, it's actually the biggest adversity that they faced. That is what spurred them on to greater success. They didn't recognize that at the moment. Like Janine Shepard, when she was hit by a truck, she didn't say, oh, thank God, now my life is, is finally better. It was a process a year or two after that. When Jim Stovall was told at the age of 17 that he would go totally blind, he didn't, you know, he didn't say, oh, my God, how, how lucky am I? It was a process of finding out who he was, really getting in touch with his inner voice that enabled him to then impact dozens of countries and hundreds of millions of people around the world. But to get back to your point around what mindset do people have to be in to absorb it, I think it does differ for each person, but there is no question that if you are at very much a life crossroads, whether you've lost a job or you're in a relationship or something's happened with a friendship, just some type of awareness that things for you aren't great and there's got to be a better way and that you can actually motivate yourself to not only read the book but take action along the way that is that will completely transform your life but the ones who aren't motivated to even pick up a book and read it very yeah. very difficult to help them but one of the first things that you can do is get people excited about the possibilities for them and then gently introduce these resources that can make it happen. But you also see people, they want to go and do one enormous leap, which is just not sustainable for most people. You can see that in, in health, you see it in fitness, but if you're doing something that enables them to consistently and simply apply this action over time, that is what turns ordinary actions into extraordinary achievement. It's not one cataclysmic action. It is being consistent and keeping it simple. Yeah, there, man, there's so many like nuggets that you had, you had mentioned in that, in that, uh, you know, dialogue. Listen, this is so a connection I've been talking about on the podcast lately for the last, I would say six months or so, uh, is, a, is around this very theme. I don't, I didn't even think we were going to go, go here, but you're, you're, I, I think that the, our, especially Americans, you know, our, our society is, uh, con conditioned in a very, uh, similar way, depending on you know West Coast or, or East Coast of the U.S. and and I look at you know the impact that it has on on kids as they become adults, and you hit the nail on the head. You know we're we're taught certain things about life, and it's kind of like our expectation of our future is given to us. We don't create it; we're given it, right? Which is 
go to school, get a job, have a career, you know, save for retirement. Like we're, we're told this is, this is the pathway, right? And, it, and so that, at that point, you know, when there's disruption, when you make a plan and it doesn't go the way according to plan, okay, that's when, you know, you really start to experience uh, anxiety, right? And, and, and fear. Well, I've been taught this. I'm not there anymore. Therefore, you know, what am I going to do? And I think in that questioning, you revert back to when you were a, a child in a sense where you're humble, you're not guarded, you're vulnerable, you're, you want to explore, you want to experience, you don't, you don't necessarily have this, this is the way things are going to be, I'm going to create uh, the way things are going to be. And, and I don't know that, and I look at like my kids, you know, and I have a young one who's four, then I have a 13 year old, and the difference, right, is basically schooling. And you have one who's exploratory, creative, there's other that is becoming, you know, uh, obviously because of, you know, uh, hormones and this, you know, change in life, you know, they, they look at things differently, but it's just, it's just interesting where, you know, the, the environment is very similar for Americans and they find themselves, you know, dissatisfied. Uh, and I think it because it, it, you know, it is because they're told what to do as opposed to create what they, what they can do. Yeah. And the, when you factor that into this modern society that we, that we live in, that is really, I feel like in the last 10 years, we've, we've really come into a bit of a, a different thing that enables uh, a range of emotions to come out good or bad. So when we've got this people wanting to live increasingly in their comfort zones, it's very easy for people to sit here and have a, a six hour Netflix binge. But if you extrapolate that over and over an entire year, you haven't done much. So we have this with these modern luxuries, it's a lot easier for people to stay in their comfort zone, but in the world of instant gratification with social media as well, we are, just hit like a punching bag because everyone is obsessed with Facebook likes and who likes my post and why hasn't this person liked my post? So I think having that, yeah, the modern day luxuries that make it easier for people to stay in their comfort zone with the emotional drag of social media, it is a really, really interesting thing. But the people who are not afraid to show their vulnerabilities, they have no, that is, that to me is what self-esteem is. You're comfortable in your own skin. You're happy showing your vulnerabilities to the world. You don't really have anything to prove externally. You've just got something to prove to yourself and you get very, very clear on a plan. You understand your perfect destination and where you want to go and how many lives you want to impact. And you take action every day to get towards those goals. That is, is the big difference to me between people who are happy to sit on the, on the couch and, and scroll through social media versus those who are comfortable in, in their own skin and, and really are, are ambitious and excited at the opportunity to help people around them. Well, I think, you know, there's some, there's some common, common things that you're, that you're saying here, which I, which I totally believe in. I think one is, is the context the context of fear and it, and that right, right there. So I would say the context of fear and the context of, of failure and what those, what those two things mean. Cause I think we're given, you know, negative connotations to both of them, right. Based on social conditioning. But I, you know, I know Napoleon Hill talks a lot about both, you know, the f understanding the purpose of fear, understanding the purpose of failure. Okay. Removes the, that negative connotation. And it allows kind of this, this freedom, I would, I, I would say. Have you, seen, have you seen that? Yeah, a big part of thinking, Gray Rich, is what thoughts you allow you enter your mind and what you do with them. So mm -hmm. that comes around to like the negative and toxic environment. If you've got very, very clear goals, one of the first things that you should do is look at your environment, like literally your living environment, mm -hmm. who the people are that you spend the most time with, what are you doing to get outside your comfort zone, where so many people these days get really, really upset about a, a news article or some news report when the objective of the media right now is not to inform the public. I wish it was, but it's not. Uh -uh. The objective of the media is to sell newspapers, but their circulation is that, but yet they still get mad at it. <laughs> yeah. Their circulation's down. So, all right, well then they need advertising clicks on their, on their articles. So they need to create an article that is the most sensationalist thing that they can, but people read this and they feel this negativity like it's happening to them personally when in many cases it's a bit of a you know a fluff made up article and i think people who surround themselves with positive environment and focus there, there are two things in our lives there are things that we can control and things that we can't control but if you focus on take it or leave it take it with a grain of salt the things that you can't control and get very very busy at work on the things that you can control to to make it happen
Yeah. And, and again, I think that comes down to the whole control idea is everyone, you, you want to control your life and it comes down to fear and it's fear of what it's, it's the idea of failure. You want to control because you don't want to fail, but in the end it's like failure, failure is the greatest lesson. And, and I would assume, you know, you, you agree with the idea of uh, detachment, right? Sometimes you make goals and sometimes you, you know, have a certain passion or, or you know, an, an initiative and it, you know, you have an idea of how it's going to work out, but I would, I, I, with, with a lot of Napoleon Hill's uh, teachings, you don't know exactly how it's going to come about, <clears throat> but yet we're so taught to, this is the path, you know, and we rationalize and conceptualize, okay, I have to go here first and here next and here next and here next and here next. Like we have this kind of path mapped out and when it doesn't go according to plan, we get frustrated and quit. Right. But I would, you know, from what I've learned from, you know, law of success and think and grow rich is the idea where if you have a strong passion towards something, okay, your definite chief, your definite chief aim, okay, if that is, is strong, that's what you focus on. That's what you try to, to control and the way in which it comes about, okay, some of the stuff's going to be in your control, some of it isn't, but it's not attaching to exactly how it has to happen. Yeah. And how you, how you handle the adversity is a really big one yeah. of that too. That's about the only thing that really is guaranteed is that you will face enormous adversity along the way. And true success only comes when you have paid the price in advance and in full. There are no bargains at the counter of success. So it's ultimately what happens when that adversity strikes and whether you have been hit, you know, the, to touch on the examples that we mentioned earlier that are also in the book and the film, like Janine Shepard literally hit by a truck Jim Stovall told him he's going blind. There's Grant Cardone, who was a, after he lost three of the most important male mentors in his life at the age of 15, he turned to drugs for 10 years, but he was able to turn all that around via a simple shift in mindset. It's how you handle this adversity when it inevitably strikes is what will determine where you end up. But a lot of people go through life with that chip on their shoulder and they just enable it to, to beat them down. And that's when you start criticizing others rather than focusing on, on what you can do in your own life and what, what steps that you can take. You know, it's a mindset of, of happening to you and happening for you. And, and I think that's what life, I think that's what life is in, in a very easy explanation is it's an environment for us to grow and you have to have a certain amount of pressure, right? And things happen to you to, to grow. And happening for you is, yeah, there's, adver there's always going to be adversity. You know, utopia is not part of, you know, reality. And it's, you know, understanding the context by which it's happening and then shifting your mindset to what you can control. And it typically is the reaction to it, right? And I, I know that, you know, some of those extreme circumstances where people, you know, lose sight or have an accident or lose a loved one, right? Those are, those are adverse, adverse moments, but at the same time, those are uh, powerfully, you know, transformational moments because of, uh, how profound the environment is in which you're now thinking. Definitely. A big, a big theme of this book and the film as well is that there really are no valid excuses for permanent defeat. We all come across adversity and failure is the essential ingredient. Like we spoke about before, it is so important. It's what forges us into being stronger people worthy of, of our future success. But how we, when this adversity strikes, how we handle it is, is just so important, but also because of the people that we have referenced in the book, it proves that all these people, I, I challenge someone to, to find, uh, to give me an example of someone who has had to go through more than what the people in this book have gone through, or some of them, uh, some of them in particular. We all go through things that for us are very, very difficult. I'm really not saying that. It is, of course, in our own context, we go, we, all of us, 100% of people on this planet go through very difficult, very challenging moments but there are people who have been able to achieve a lot more from a much worse, you know, background or starting point. History has proven countless times that those who succeed do so irrespective of temporary adversity or financial starting point or ethnicity or any other perceived disadvantage. It's the consistent application of a proven set of success principles. Like we mentioned earlier, like being simple and being consistent. And that's the difference. I mean, that again, going back to our original point, that's, I think that's the difference, right? Because people go through horrible times, right? And I, and I know some of the stories that, that you outline in the book and the movie and the icons that you, you know, have had, you know, not only in the movie, but also supporting the movie, uh, you know, th they've gone through difficult times, but the difference is, is the connection they made to the context of that pain, that failure, 
um, that disappointment and, and what they did about it. Cause far too many people are just continually going through that cycle, right. Of failure after failure, after failure, after failure. And they're not connecting the dots as to, you know, what, what message or teaching is the universe trying to smack into your, into your brain. I think that think and grow rich is kind of the catalyst in, in a sense. Yeah. And when you, when you start to blame others and think smaller, it's like your blame increases and then you start thinking smaller and smaller. And the failure increases too. Absolutely. That's the, that's the importance of surrounding yourself with people. Like if you've gone through a very, very difficult time surrounding yourself with the right people who can get you back on track and really elevate your thinking and also put you in a path where you can really position yourself for massive success, which is getting very, very clear on what you want, your big long-term goals and coming up with the tactics, what daily actions are you going to take, uh, to take to achieve it? Because you don't need to worry about what rewards you're getting from each day. Focus about putting in the work each day and the rewards will come uh, through time. And it's interesting. It's not that, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these teachings, a lot of what's said, I mean, mo most people would read it and would, would, you know, understand it. I think there's lots of, there's tons of personal development books that have been written over, over the years. Right. But it, it really comes down to, you know, as you were saying, is the, uh, is the application. Uh, maybe talk about, you know, some of the, the iconic names that, you know, either helped support uh, or were in the actual film itself. And, it, you know, you being able to see their stories and the impact that, you know, what we've been talking about had on their lives. Barbara Corcoran's a good one. So she, a lot of people know Barbara from ABC's Shark Tank, a great television show, especially for, uh, for entrepreneurs. I was always anybody, a fan yes, of Shark Tank. For anybody, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a great show. And Barbara was, she grew up in New Jersey. She was one of, I think, 11 kids. So she had a, a huge family, came from very humble beginnings. She was dyslexic. So she really struggled in the schoolroom. But her big thing was imagination. And because she did struggle academically, it forced her to be good with people. And that was what enabled her to get ahead. So she was waitressing at a diner and all of a sudden, you know, she had the right stepping stones and the right people in place and the right thinking that enabled her to succeed in the New York property scene during the eighties and nineties. Like that is a very, very difficult area to succeed in, especially as a young woman. So she has done a, an outstanding job at all that stuff. So her, her story is really great. And she actually said about her original copy of Think and Grow Rich, she feels like it, it looked like it was dipped in a vat of yellow paint because she highlighted that many things about it. So she talks about the importance of belief that if you believe you're capable, then you are capable. Little things like that are so simple, but so important. There's Lewis Howes, who people might know as the founder and host of the School of Greatness podcast. He's a two-time New York Times bestselling author. Mm -hmm. But seven years ago when he was broke, uh, he's injured. He had a broken wrist with a full length arm cast and was living on his sister's couch. Uh, he was also dyslexic. He had dropped out of college, but he came across two books, the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss and think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill. And that is what really elevated his thinking and, and got him to understand that his sporting success, what had happened was every successful sporting team has a coach to help them keep aligned with their mission and, and keep everyone focused on what jobs that they need to do. So folk, uh, Lewis tried to figure out what areas were important to the success that he wanted to have things like public speaking and branding and product design. And an example on the public speaking side, he found a mentor who got him excited about that and would take him along to Toastmasters once a week. And despite being terrified, he still went every single week. And after one year, he had transmuted his biggest weakness and his biggest fear into his greatest strength and a source of income. So little things like that. So there's, I do love the story of Janine Shepard. I do talk about it a lot, but uh, she was, after she was hit by the truck, she was elevated. Uh, sorry. She was airlifted to a hospital in, in Sydney where her parents were told that she wouldn't live. And then 10 days later, she woke up out of a coma and then spent six months in the spinal ward and what she has been able to achieve since then, it really is incredible. She's a multiple time best-selling author. There have been films made about her. Uh, she travels the world as a motivational speaker. She's got a gold cast video that came out recently on Facebook that has more than 15 million views. I've seen that now. Huh? It's the most inspiring story. And another point that I want to get across with the book is that you don't need to be a Hollywood celebrity for your life to be considered a success. You don't need to have 50 million followers on Instagram for your life to be a success. As long as you're very comfortable, 
you're rich in love, you're rich in relationships, you're living with gratitude, but still focused on yeah. helping all the people around you. It's so important. So we've got a lot of people in here who might necessarily be household names, but, but have been very, very successful in their own lives too. We've got Napoleon Hill's grandson who had a late career change after spending, I think it was three decades in the Marines and he ended up going to medical school and becoming a doctor. And he had some incredible things happen after that. Uh, we've got Satish Verma, who's the president of the Think and Grow Rich Institute in Canada. And he grew up in the slums of India during a very tumultuous time and was able to leave the country, I think with $8 to his name. And what he was able to achieve after that, really quite extraordinary. But we've also got some of the big, the big hitters like Bob Proctor and Rob Deerdeck and Grant Cardone and Sharon Lecter from Rich Dad, Poor Dad. We've got a, a whole, a very eclectic uh, mix of people, but I'm just so, so honored to be in a position to have been able to tell their stories. Well, we're going to get the word out. I mean, it's a, it's a phenomenal film. Again, it, it really, I think it's a book that has made, you know, a difference in millions of people's lives. And I think we're, we hit on some of the core concepts, you know, of course it'd take hours to really dive into all, to all of them, but I'm going to hit on one last thing that you said, and then, uh, and then I'll give you the final word and then we'll, we'll make sure that we promote this and uh, get people aware of, uh, of the film that's online. Uh, as well as uh, as well as the book, but one thing you you know one thing you said which is interesting, and I think this is, you know what I've at least what I've thought is is kind of what we're what we're conditioned to do is is that results are the things that are going to make us happy, right? Results are the ones that are going to you know clear the playing field, you know get us to to success, but in the end, it, it ultimately, in, in my opinion, right, it it comes down to. Uh, what that drive is, it's really never success. The drive is, is, rare, is rarely that, but yet that's what the result is. And the drive always comes down to, you know, taking, you know, who, who you are, what your, what your purpose and passion is, and figuring out a way to impact the lives of other people. I think that becomes that, you know, that, that overarching drive of, of most people that I've, I've seen, and the results end up being success. Success doesn't create that, right? It's the, it's the uh, result of that. And I think it's, it's very subtle, uh, but in the end, it's like, you know, why do they have shows of what is, you know, your life look as a lottery winner? What does your life look like if you're, you know, at this extra, so people are like, I'm going to be happy if I could have that lifestyle. And it's like, that's not the way it works. It's backwards to that. And, you know, and that's where you hit on that subtly, but I think that's a very important point to get across. And you touch on lotto winners and most uh, lotto winners and most of them are bankrupt okay. uh, within two or three years afterwards. You look at people who, you know, NFL players, it's a, a bit of a sad reality that, that most of them end up broke within three or four years after leaving the NFL as well. It just easy come, easy go. But if, uh, yeah, if you're really focused on, on building a long-term uh, growth plan, which Think and Grow Rich, the legacy and the original Think and Grow Rich do, a lot of young people ask me what the, you know, how can they get out there and, and find their passion and, and, and live with passion because everyone talks about that. But most people spend their lives sitting in their apartments or in their homes, just hanging out with the same people. And it's very, very difficult to sort of broaden your awareness when you're in that little cycle. So I encourage people to get off the couch, get out of their comfort zone, attend events, meet as many people as you can. And while you're doing that, increasingly become a person of value. And over time, you'll start to see something. You don't need to have a, a whole life plan mapped out at the age of 16 or at 20 or 25. Just keep putting in the work each day, taking consistent purposeful action. And over time, it will all be, uh, it will all be revealed to you. And then you can spend the rest of your life doing that thing. Well, that was one of those core, one of core teaching I, I try to get across to my, to my kids is, you know, when they are down and out, when they're upset, you know, it's go help somebody, go figure out a way. Cause most, cause everything, the upset, disappointment, sitting on the couch, that's all, you know, it's all mental that drives that. And it's a very egocentric way of, of viewing the world. And that's where it's like snap out of it and go help other people. And when that happens, when that mindset happens, it may be something, you know, irrelevant in the beginning, right? As far as the actual action itself, but the mental side of it will allow you to change your frame to the world in which you can figure out a way to help as many people as possible. And I think that, I don't know, that, that's, it's that core teaching that, that I, it sounds so easy, but it's one of the most difficult things for people to, to, you know, to develop. Definitely. And helping those less fortunate is one of the best ways to be, to be grateful as well. I feel like people who don't know 
how to properly practice gratitude just need to open their eyes a little bit more to what's around them because there is so much suffering in the communities that we live in, but there is also so much happiness and so many opportunities to make a difference in other people's lives. And the shift, I think the shift is so, is so subtle, but it's so profound and insignificant because it's all mindset misery, misery and full joy is, is, Shift in mindset. It's interesting. Yeah, you can't hang around negative people and expect a positive life. <laughs> Never. All right, James, I wish we had more, a couple more hours to do this, but uh, thank you for what you've done. I mean, thank you for being involved in this project, getting the word out, because these are, these are the things that I, I believe are, have helped society and will continue to help society because, uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, the, these are timeless, timeless principles. You've just kind of put a different, you know, different skin on it uh, in the 20, 21st century. Yeah, just excited that yeah, just excited to share all the stories with the world and help people achieve yeah the success in their own lives. All right, James, it is it's been so awesome to have you on. Uh, so we're gonna get the word out. We're gonna help kind of promote the the film and the movie. And I wish you the uh, the success you deserve. Thanks for having me on, Patrick. Thank you for joining us as the Wealth Standard Podcast spends all of 2018 celebrating life liberty and property. Be sure to leave us a review on iTunes and we'll see you on the next one.